Welcome to As Built, the podcast produced by the Studio Graphic Machine about architecture firms and buildings and how both get built. I am Brian Jones, your host for this episode. My guest today is David Thompson, principal and founder of Assemblage, a firm based in Los Angeles. David, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to start off a little bit thinking back a number of years and about the beginning of your firm. And I wanted to know, how did you decide you wanted to start your own firm? Uh, well, that's a, it's a great question. It takes me way back into the time capsules of my mind and history. But really, it really started way back at the end of my, my school at Tulane University. I think what, what started happening when I was in school, we were talking about big ideas and big things. And I was still learning how to communicate these ideas. And I got interested in furniture right at the end of school. And partly the reason I got into it was that it was at a scale that I could put in my hands and I could look at in detail and then sketch those ideas in a way that I understand what I was communicating. So my first job out of school was with David Hertz at his firm at the time called Synthesis, where they were doing architectural projects, but mostly they were doing manufacturing of lightweight concrete. So while I was starting in on a couple of these architectural projects, I was also doing these very small kitchen countertop projects or a custom furniture project. And it, again, it was fueling this kind of need for me to drop the scale down. So at that time I was, I discovered that I had an entrepreneurial spirit going on and I was like, oh, uh, people will, I could go try and get commissions for furniture, but maybe not for a house because I had no experience. So that's really. When I, then I started getting into getting these furniture commissions and starting to want to want to seek out, trying to push a furniture line. I realized very early on, I was in my first year or two out of school. I really discovered that I had this entrepreneurial fuel to, to, to fire and that I needed to keep that going. And so that was really the beginnings of it. And I worked at Lork and I worked, I worked at uh, David Hertz's for a while. I worked at another firm for a little bit. And then from there. I basically headed off. To, I started a project here in Los Angeles. It was like 1997, I want to say. And I started a little project and then I took my firm off to New York. So it was really based out of this desire to bring the scale down for myself. And then out of that sort of, it unleashed this entrepreneurial spirit that I had inside. So from there, it was just, just working. I tried to do a furniture line for a while, and then it was just trying to get the scale of these projects so bigger and bigger as, as we grew. How did you go about establishing the vision for the firm and its core principles? You have a very specific set on your site that uh, you talk about, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about when that came to be in your practice. Was that from the very beginning or how did that evolve along the way? It's, it evolved still from my early days. I think the idea of craft that we, I think there's a lot of examples out in our work shows up from the furniture background, my experience with David Hertz, and then later on with Lorcan O'Hurt really helped to craft the sensibilities I have that were sort of rooted in Southern California modernism and things like that. I'm taking cues from all of the stuff about designing things in Los Angeles and in Southern California that allows us to really play with this notion of indoor outdoor because we have such good weather all year round, but it's just building on a foundation that kind of has been with me since, since I really started in the field of architecture and all of those influences that I was a part of. I think it's been an evolution, but I think where we are now is really just a really strong evolution from where we started and have just been building upon that over time. And, uh, and I think these core principles continue to evolve as we go and we grow and we expand into different marketplaces and different types of projects and things like that. So, so when you started, you mentioned kind of the scale of things and bringing it all down. And when you started, it was you and you began this, this firm, yeah. but as you've grown and you've added more people to that, how have you communicated that those core sets of ideas that the firm is about to those was well, it part of the interview process or go ahead. Uh, yeah, to some degree it, it is a part of the interview process, but one of the things that I strive for in my practice is the firm culture. The firm culture means a lot to me. And it's about who we are and what we're doing and how we do it and things like that. But it's also about making a place where people want to come and be. So they want to be a part of that culture. We try to enjoy ourselves here as much as we can and the hard, hard challenges that have come with doing architecture. We, uh, we try and embody that culture and that philosophy of 
into the way we approach doing projects. It's very collaborative. The work with in the studio is very collaborative and everybody has a voice and has the ability to be a part of the process. So it's really communicated from very, very early on. I think it's, it's a part of the interview process, but it is a part of who we are. And it, uh, it speaks about the way we look at architecture, the way we process the, the process of architecture. And then just the idea that we, I want to enjoy the time I'm here and the people I'm with and I want them to be like-minded people. And then I'm excited about all the things that they bring outside of the firm into the firm. So it is about the assembling of people too. And, and that's part of the name of our firm is assemblage and it's purposeful in that it's assembling all kinds of different aspects that go into the practice of architecture. And at the end of the day, trying to do cutting edge architecture that is on the edge of contemporary discourse. So the collaboration was actually the thing that I was the most compelled by looking over your office and thinking about how that's a real challenge in a day-to-day -day practice to bring into play. And mm -hmm. how does it extend into the relationship with the client? How do you does that become part of the conversation or is it an internal collaboration or how do you make that? It's all of those, all of the above. It certainly is a conversation with the client in the sense that we, each project is unique in and of itself. And the client is often that unique component, right? We may be designing five houses, but each house hopefully will be different as a result of the client. We, we are good communicators, but we're also really good listeners. So we do a lot to sit and listen to what our clients are saying. And our clients may know a little more about the site than we do because they've been living there or whatever this situation may be. So those are, that's all information for us. And we try and communicate that from the, the get go and the way in which we process these projects internally is very collaborative. The way we look and approach the process throughout the entire process with all the teams, the parties involved is very collaborative. The relationship with our builder is very collaborative, and we try and make that pretty clear from the get-go. And so that permeates into the client too. We want the clients a key component to the process and to the, to this particular project. And so they're an important component and we want to involve them in that way and their feedback and their, their knowledge and information of their particular needs and their particular site are key components for us. So that's really, so the builder, let's focus in on that just a little bit. So walk me through that conversation when you're interviewing builders about how you convey what the process will be like and how they, what they can expect from a conversation during the process. Yeah. I think that with the contractors, we find them to be one of the key, key components, right? As good as the ideas can be, if they're not executed properly, the project can fall on its face. And so we really from a very early point in the process, we try and establish relationships with our contractors early on and make them a part of the process. Because we know how to build and we know how to build pretty well, but we're not builders, we're architects. And we need these builders to execute this. So we wanna make them, we wanna make this as much of a team process as we can. We try and make that, that collaborative part between the builder and ourselves, a really key component to the success of the project. So we approach it in a way to be like, we need you help us execute this vision that we have. And we want to make their voice heard. We want to make them a part of the process and we welcome that influence in because we're not there to tell them necessarily how to build everything. That's, they're going to tell us means and methods really. And we're not, we're not builders. So we don't execute that stuff on a daily basis. We know how to think about it and we know how to process it, but there's something about guys laying brick or laying tile or whatever that are sequencing things and things like that. We don't necessarily, we're not experts in, we can think through it, but we're not experts. And so we really reach out to those guys to be like, Hey, this is our vision and we need you to get there and really try and create that relationship of collaboration from the get-go to say, hey, this is not us against you. We're not, we're not the ones that are, we're not master builders as they, as we were in the past. We're not masons by trade that are, are trained as architects. It's just not that case. So we really do look to that relationship as a way of a resource that we can use to 
And so we see that team building as something that is a successful component to the process. Sure. Switching gears a little bit, in your projects, how light is used and the idea of incorporating the landscape into the design consideration seems strongly connected, as you mentioned earlier, to the Southern California location of your firm. And as your work has expanded beyond that geography, how have you implemented your firm's aesthetic and approach in other geographic locations? That's a great question. And in the Southern California sensibilities, are they're desired all over the world. Sure. If only um, the weather would cooperate. <laughs> Does. And often that sensibility is something that we try and carry to these other geographic locations. And we have some of our houses that because of the Southern California climate, we can completely wide open, open up and pretty much live outside. And we know we can't really do that in some of the other geographies, but we do try and create extensions of the living experience out into the landscape. So the landscape component of these projects is a crucial piece because we don't see a spe specific, when we talk about single family residential, we don't try and limit ourselves to the square footage of the house. We try and extend your eye, your living experience out into the landscape, to the perimeters of the property and beyond to really pull that landscape architecture component together as much as we can. So we try and really push those sensibilities that we're using here in Southern California yes. to other geographies as much as we physically can. And we've run into some, but like we had a project in Washington, DC, where we really basically we had this big patio outside of the backyard and we basically had to make the backside glass. We couldn't make it all sliding doors. And then we built this, this little separated screened in porch because they can't be always, most of the time, they can't hang out in that weather. But with the screened in porch, you've got this beautiful outdoor space that allows you to be protected from some of those elements and still be engaged in the landscape. So even in that, we were trying to bring a Southern California sense to this other climate. And as a result, had to kind of pivot a little bit and utilize some other kind of regional methods to get the same result. So I think it's about the core principles when we're thinking about these projects in the beginning and how to then can we implement them in these other places. Thinking a little bit about that, when you're first talking with a, a prospect or a client, how do you present that design intention in those first conversations that you have with someone? Is it is that something that they're bringing to you that's already, they already know it? Or is it something that you're bringing up as part of the initial conversation? Fortunately, at this point of our of, a, of our life as assemblage, people are now, they're aware of who we are. So usually by the time they've reached out to us, they are like, oh, we like what you're doing. We like the sensibilities that you bring. We, we certainly, we have one up where somebody is coming to us and they're aware of who we are and what we know. They're not just coming for architectural services and say, what do you guys do and how do you do it? We do have, in the beginning stages, we walk them through some of the sensibilities that we have implemented in other projects and how, the, how we would use similar kinds of strategies and things like that in this particular project. We might tailor that if the project is more similar to another project we've done or something like that. But a lot of it, fortunately, at this stage, people are aware of the sensibilities. And then we talk them through how those may apply and be utilized on their particular project. I want to talk a little bit about one of the sensibilities in particular that I found really interesting, which is the idea of restraint. You talk a little bit about that in your promotional materials, but you also bringing that into a conversation, what's the client reaction when you're thinking, or how does that enter the conversation with the project? Is it something that they're already accepting of? We talked a little bit about what they're already aware of you, but that idea of restraint as being part of it. I, I think restraint is not necessarily a a descriptive term that we may utilize when we're in the process. I think it may be part of the internal process sometimes, where sometimes, and I suppose it can become a dialogue sometimes with clients, but I think of it most importantly is when we are in our own process, our own iterative process for whatever the project may be. And so we're walking through the steps of the design process and there are moments, and I've had many of them, where we have to stop ourselves too and say, okay, we're, we've gone down this road and now maybe we've mixed up a little too much and we've got to pull ourselves back. 
because either something is feeling forced or something is feeling like there isn't a good conciliation of this or something like that. There's often like what I find my, in our processes of our teams running into blocks. Sometimes that's where the restraint comes in, where sometimes we have to say, you know what? We got to pull back here. We've got one too many moves going, or we've got one too many thing we're going to try to do, and we got to quiet it all down a little. Sometimes that's where I find restraint to be more of an internal dialogue and an internal process for us to remind ourselves that our success comes sometimes when it's simplified more than we may think. We may be trying to do something or trying to manipulate something in some ways where sometimes we have to go, you know what? I think we have stepped out of bounds here. We've got to, we've got to just simplify and quiet down a little bit. And that's usually where we find ourselves. And then we we're getting better and better at that, depending on the project. And sometimes it take up, might take us a little longer. Sometimes we start out that way, but I do find ourselves regularly coming in and checking ourselves to just be like, we got to hone it in here a little bit. Do you think that the collaborative process that we talked about at the top of the show, do you think that helps make that part of the conversation more freely? Yeah. And I also think that collaborative process gets us talking, right? Gets us communicating together. And when we're talking about it sometimes and we're not siloed in that way, it's a way it will work collaborative. And again, I think by making that culture where we feel like people are part of the process and have a voice in the process, I'd like to think that we've got an open environment where people can speak freely and we can talk about what we think is right and not who's got the right answer, but how we, how we can get there collectively and what is the right answer from the project. And that comes through dialogue and conversation and iteration. And yeah, so I think the collaborative process can help that for sure. So in thinking back over the kind of lifespan of your career, of your firm, and what would you say is like the most important thing that you have found or learned in the process of building a practice? I think it's, I think it's rather challenging to distill it down into one significant thing because it's certainly been, it's certainly been a lot of significant things, but I don't think this is something that I necessarily learned because I knew this from the get go, but I'm better with better people around me. I'm, I, 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 my people are so important to me and what a role they play in order for us to execute architecture. It's a very challenging profession and I think the educational process, although it may be changing a little bit, it teaches us to be this sort of singular captain at the helm, knowing everything. And sometimes I think knowing everything gets us into trouble. And I think we're better collectively and I think we're better as, and so I have, I have endeavored through my career to, to put great people together to do this. And I think that, I think I'm only as good as my people. And so I've learned that that's what we, that's what we deliver thinking, good collective, smart thinking, problem solving, but there's a lot of I's to dot, a lot of T's to cross to get these things done. So doing them by yourself is really virtually impossible. I think there are people that do it, but when you start to scale a practice, you need people. And so. I, again, I don't necessarily say that's the most significant thing I've learned because I knew that going in, my mom ran my dad's practice as a kid and she always told me how important people were. So I came into this knowing it, but I still think it's one of the more powerful things about running a practice. Awesome. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule. I've really appreciated the time to have this uh, conversation with you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Yeah.